ready? I'd like to call the Town Council work session to order Tuesday, January 4th, 2011, and it is 6.40. If we could stand, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you um, and welcome. Just want to inform uh, the audience here that this is a public work session and uh, if you have questions at the end, uh, um, we would be glad to entertain your questions. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Alfred. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. This is the first of three uh, budget work sessions dealing with the capital improvement program. First hearing uh, is tonight. The, uh, the hearing tonight will deal with the overall financial position of the community, as well as long-term financial programs, exclusive, uh, exclusive of leisure service programs, that would be senior programs, recreation. Those will be uh, considered at tomorrow night's uh, uh, hearing. The, uh, we'll also be looking at the overall <coughs> pay-as-you-go capital budget, exclusive of the leisure services. Tomorrow evening, we'll do open space, recreation, senior programming, as well as uh, fair share development fees. On January 13th at 6.30, we will meet uh, council and school committee to review the uh, long-term financial program of the school department's uh, capital budget and capital improvement uh, program for the six-year term. So starting out tonight, uh, I have prepared uh, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, my accountant, Mr. Lord, has indicated that with 113 slides that so we can't spend more than one minute per slide, but uh, I think that several of them will go much quicker than one minute, so we can go a little bit longer on a couple, but he will be keeping time on me. Uh, in starting out, just a little bit of detail. The capital improvement program really has three specific goals. One, to provide a community uh, a need statement, and this is contained within my budget message on page one. Uh, secondly, to provide for the development of a pri prioritization and implementation schedule to meet those community needs that have been identified. And third, to provide for the financial data relative to the community's ability to manage and to finance the cost of those programs once established by the council. This year I've also included a focus. This is, an, is not in the capital uh, uh, program, but I've had several questions on how, does, how did we look this year differently than we have in the past at the program. Obviously, be, based on economic times, we've uh, been as fiscally conservative as always, yet I think we've taken <coughs> one step further back. We've reviewed all of the capital projects that have been resident to the uh, previously approved capital improvement program and looked for full justification of each of the projects as well as the time schedules. On some of the time schedules, we've, uh, we've uh, reallocated time and deferred projects to later years in hopes that uh, the economy will turn around and there'll be a greater ability for the community to be able to financially manage the cost associated with those programs. Secondly, we've looked to reduce debt service costs by reducing uh, future bonding projects and revising the time schedules on some of the major projects that uh, have been uh, included in prior year capital improvement uh, programs. Uh, obviously, with a six-year program updated on an annual basis, many projects may stay as many as eight or ten years before they're, they're finally completed if uh, financing options uh, cannot be, uh, be resolved. We look uh, certainly for uh, philanthropic grants, uh, state assistance on each project, and look at the uh, property tax support or bonding as the funding source of last resort. We also identify all the major uh, lead projects. This is different than in prior years. A great deal of discussion has been had over the past few years on the town's uh, 
use of capital reserve funds. What I've attempted to do in this document is to identify all the different capital reserve funds to show how money flows into those uh, reserve funds and looks toward projects that may be completed several years down the line. Uh, we are also presenting to you those projects where the municipality was the lead on the project, even if those projects are not going to be paid for with local money. As an illustration, the intermodal, uh, uh, intermodal facility uh, to be constructed on Main Street will be totally paid for using fed, uh, state and federal dollars. <coughs> it was a municipal lead project where we had anticipated in the prior years that there would be tax dollars or impact fees used to pay down that cost. We're going to show that project in its entirety as part of the capital improvement program, even though it will have no local cost because it does meet a specific community need. We're also looking to identify projects uh, that will combine the, you know, the capital reserve funding, the pay as you, uh, the pay as you go section of the capital budget uh, in each of the, uh, the, the different projects that uh, are identified tonight. Uh, we've restructured the capital improvement program to allow for expansion of the road improvement program. Uh, this effort has been made to try to minimize any uh, additional property tax supports by delaying some of the other projects that we have looked at in the past where we see that the road improvement program should take a higher priority and require greater funding assistance uh, during the overall six-year six year, uh, term of the, uh, the capital program. Uh, capital programs, just in terms of a refresher, capital facilities and infrastructure referred to as uh, uh, municipal and school facilities, bridges, streets, roads, water, sewer systems, <coughs> All of those are the infrastructure that, uh, that uh, is used to manage the services that the town provides. The objective of the capital improvement program is to ensure that the facilities, as well as the infrastructure necessary to be able to accommodate community needs, are in fact addressed on a timely basis. Uh, one of the uh, major concerns a community should have is that if it, it fails to maintain its buildings, fails to maintain uh, its road network, sewer, wastewater systems, because the cost of non-maintenance is much higher than the cost of, uh, of ongoing maintenance. Capital improvements we also look at uh, as being major non-reoccurring tangible uh, fixed asset improvements uh, that exceed $10,000. You will see a few items here of $5,000 going through the capital budget, and that's because those are monies being transferred to capital reserve funds for later, uh, <coughs> for later year funding of a, uh, of a capital improvement. In starting out, uh, if you look at uh, page two, we provide a summary of the adopted 2010-11 and the proposed 2011-2012 uh, combined program for capital uh, improvements. We're looking at a program which uh, would cost $20,935,000. Again, those are not all local dollars. Those are a combination of, uh, of state dollars, federal dollars, uh, that are coming in, that are programs that are coming through the municipal sector. I do want to also uh, uh, make reference to the fact that uh, because we have identified capital projects that uh, have not been identified in the past that use capital reserve funding, the, uh, the program looks like it's expanding by $1,472,000. It is not. Uh, in actuality, we've added uh, five projects that have been ongoing projects, but were not identified uh, because of the use of the capital reserves, which cost a million one thousand dollars. So that, if we restated the uh, current year budget, those new programs would have to be added to that base. We're also expanding two programs. The Public Works is up by uh, Public Works Road Improvements expanding by $2 million, as I said earlier. And the Municipal Gym Project, which is put in an out year, is up $100,000. To address being able to increase those programs, we're also seeing six project uh, areas in the current year that are being reduced. Those include uh, open space uh, uh, program dollars, for future land acquisitions by about 250,000. <coughs> the intermodal facility is down $105,000. It's 
Seniors uh, programming is down 88,000. Land acquisition, 700,000. Uh, the town hall is down about 6,000, and the schools program for the six years is down about 400. And the bike paths are down about 80. So there's a 1.629 million dollar reduction on the base program, a 2.1 million dollar increase as far as expanded programs, and programs that have just been identified this year that uh, if they had been identified in the prior year would have been worth one million dollars. So essentially you're looking at about a $471,000 program expansion if you were comparing a restated 2010-2011 year to the 2011-2012 year that's presented on the slide. The, uh, <clears throat> The second section of the capital improvement program looks at the first year of the pay-as-you-go portion of the budget or the capital budget. Uh, within that program, we're looking at a uh, total requirement of $1.9 million. That's up from $1.6 million. 160000 of that is based on what the school department submitted for their capital budget. I do not think that the $270,000 that's presented will in fact be a bottom line number that uh, will come as a component of the school committee's budget when it is submitted to us on uh, February 14th. <clears throat> if it still is there, I'm not sure that it'll remain that high by the time the budget is uh, incorporated into the council's budget as far as the transfer of property tax. Without that uh, $160,000 increase, uh, the general fund would be up about 18,000. It's important to note that water and wastewater enterprise funds are up, but none of those take property taxes. Those are all paid for through the user base and the uh, user fees that are charged to, uh, to each, of the, uh, each of the principals. As far as the wastewater program is concerned, the $310,000, <coughs> that is for all regional partners. Again, we're managing on behalf of Narragansett and the university. The, uh, the town share of that is probably about, uh, about $180,000. So uh, while it's nice to have comparisons, you have to have qualifications on how those, uh, those are presented. Overall, the, uh, the program's up 645000 Again, if you netted out the million one that uh, is in new programs that have been identified but are ongoing programs, uh, we would actually be seeing a decrease in the overall program. Uh, moving on, I'm not going to go through every page of the, uh, of the budget document. I'm just going to hit some of the uh, uh, information that I think are charts that are important. On page 9 and 10 of the capital, uh, capital budget document, if people are following along there, uh, we show the, uh, the population growth. We're still estimating a population of around 31,409 for the uh, 2010 year. That estimate is based really on, two, uh, on two, uh, two objectives. Starting out with the base from the uh, 2000 year of 27,921, since that time there's been 1,721 houses constructed in South Kingstown or uh, uh, units, housing units that have been constructed assuming 1.92 people, which is half of what the family average was in 2000, that would add 3,316 people. We're also looking at the uh, 172 more births over the 10-year period than there were deaths in the, in, the, uh, in the community itself. So if you add the 3,316 plus the 172, that's where the estimate comes from. How close that estimate will be uh, once we see the uh, census figures, which are due out probably in March or April of this year, uh, we'll make the adjustments at that time. All we can do, because it is uh, every 10 years that the uh, federal census is provided, is to be able to provide reasonable estimates as we go forward. The, uh, the next chart, uh, which is on page 10, looks at uh, what the past 10 years has been as far as residential uh, unit construction within the community. And what you can see here is that in the early years of uh, 2000 through, uh, through uh, 2005, the number of single family units that were being constructed was considerably higher than it has been in the past five years. 
In fact, when we look at the last five years, what we're seeing is that uh, there's been a change in the housing construction type in the community. Most of the units that we're seeing are uh, age 55 or older, condominium uh, type ownerships uh, or duplexes. We're seeing less and less of the uh, residential single family homes. Some of that is also, uh, some of it is related to what the, uh, the demand for housing type is, but there's also the issue of the economy. And the third component is the scarcity of uh, large tracts of land that are available for uh, continued residential development in South Kingstown. Moving on, the, uh, on page 11, we show a chart of the uh, median family income uh, housing prices, uh, median single family home prices. You can see that in 2005, at the height of, uh, of the, uh, the market, houses in South Kingstown were selling for $385,000. That was the average price of a single family home sold in, 1980, uh, in 2005. State average at that point was 271. With the downturn in the economy and the reduction in the uh, value of homes, we're now at a point where as of 2010, according to the uh, uh, Warren uh, report, we are at about an average uh, home value of 300,000 and statewide it's at 207. So we're still considerably over what the state average is, but we're still uh, not seeing any appreciable increase in the value of real estate uh, uh, within the community. This next chart, which is, uh, uh, which is also on page 11, uh, shows what the median family pricing has been since 2000 uh, from the Warren Group. You can see it was at uh, 157. It escalated incredibly fast through 2003 uh, and up through 2005, and then the erosion began. Uh, will there be an uptick on that? I uh, would certainly hope that there will be, uh, but you can also see with this chart where uh, the average assessments were. The average assessments have been considerably higher. Let me make sure it's clear. Median, median uh, sale price doesn't mean that it's the median price associated with the property in the town, but only the property that actually sold. The average assessment values here are based on the revaluations that are conducted every three years and provide a more realistic estimate of what the value would be. Uh, if there's not a lot of sale, uh, sales going on in the community itself, if some of the lower priced property is selling, the median price will be down. Obviously, if you have uh, a very high end uh, sale that's occurring at two or three million dollars, and you've got only uh, 200 houses being sold over the course of the year, that's gonna inflate what the median price higher than what the, the average. So I just caution, understand that the numbers are two different ways of approaching uh, and they're based on two separate databases altogether. One of the important things in this chart shows that where have the tax levy been associated with the average assessment value in the community? And as you can see, in the early years, uh, the, uh, the tax levy uh, per household was uh, escalating at uh, a level of in excess of 5%. It then got down once the tax cap went into place to around the 5% level and over the past two years, based on the economy that we've been dealt with, uh, we have seen uh, levy increases of 1.2% uh, in terms of what the value would be for, uh, for taxes paid on a house. Another qualification, 2010 shows that the value of a tax levy for a single family home went down to $4,914. That's an accurate portrayal of what the property taxes were due in 2010 for the house. But because we had the $500 exemption rather than the $6,000 exemption for the motor vehicles, if that house had uh, two motor vehicles uh, within the household itself, they would have picked up about $192 uh, in additional taxes. So for all intents and purposes, the levy amount on, a per, uh, on an average assessment home with taxes paid for motor vehicle and taxes paid for the house remained about constant. 
The next chart, which is presented on page 12 of, uh, of the document, looks at the labor force unemployment rate in South Kingstown. What I did on this chart was to uh, present what the uh, annualized unemployment rate was in South Kingstown since 2000 through 2009. As you can see, in 2009, it was 9.2 percent. I've updated this chart from what was in the, uh, the capital budget document, where I now am showing you November, where the capital budget was showing September. In September, it was 9.2 percent. It's now climbed again back up to 10. That's not unusual. Uh, even with a turn in the economy to the, to the good, uh, the unemployment is going to be lagging. Uh, in fact, unemployment can lag behind economic uh, turnaround by 18 to 24 months. The second part of this chart takes the same data but looks at the, uh, what the actual employment base is in the community. So what we're looking at there is uh, total employment and you can see that as we get into the eight and nine year, the employment, the amount of employable people has continued to increase, yet the, uh, the range between those that are employed and those that are unemployed has gotten wider. There's more people in South Kingstown today looking for uh, work to get off of unemployment than there were two years ago. So we're not out of the woods yet. We may be hearing that, uh, that, you know, that, that the uh, market is turning. We may be hearing a lot of things. We may also be looking at, uh, at a jobless recovery. And a jobless recovery could take several years for us to see the uh, unemployment rates get back into the 4% range, which was an average over, uh, over the last decade. This is an important chart when we start looking at What's the impact of tax levy increases as we go forward with next year's budget? Next chart is on page 13 and simply looks at the growth in the property tax uh, uh, distribution between town and school over the last several years. Uh, I received uh, uh, information in today that uh, the state has put out a document indicating that for the 2010-2011 year, as far as tax levy increases, the, that two communities out of the 39 went to 4.5%, which was the cap level. 14 communities were below the, uh, the cap level of 4.5%, uh, and 23, uh, I beg your pardon, 14 were above the 4.5, and 23 were below the 4.5. Obviously, South Kingstown was one of those 23. In fact, 34 communities raised their tax levy more than South Kingstown in the 10-11 year. We were number 35. Four communities uh, had tax levy increases of less than the 1.5 percent that South Kingstown raised. So I think that the levy growth during the, uh, during the current year certainly was indicative of uh, uh, the council's care in terms of trying to limit property tax burden increases based on the, uh, the economy that we're dealing with. Next shot, which is uh, uh, shown uh, is, I believe it's also on page 14. Uh, actually, I may not have it in there at all. This is the uh, property tax base, and I think this is important because this shows what the impact of revaluation was. I think the council is well aware of this. What we're looking at is that uh, with a smaller tax base, uh, there's a greater levy increase associated with each of the single family homes. Average single family home tax, you can see the, uh, the change over the past uh, uh, several years. As I had said, in 2011, it may be down $181, yet at the same time, the two cars would have been worth about $200 more that they would have paid. So uh, <coughs> if we had a chart that looked at this plus motor vehicles, and that would be difficult to do because some houses have, uh, as we found out, three cars or four cars, and others have, uh, have one car. So if we look just at the house uh, tax here, you can see that there's been a leveling off over the past three years uh, in terms of what is coming out of each household uh, 
on, a, uh, on an assessment base average. One of the other important things in, in developing capital improvement program is looking at what the, the debt per capita is for the community. Uh, our efforts over the past several years have been, uh, as stated earlier, to reduce the debt level within the community as a means of reducing the debt service on an annual basis, which then provides greater flexibility in what's available for tax levy distribution for service purposes. We've gone from a high of $1,428 in 2003, where as of the close of the 10-11 year, the uh, per capita will be around $833. And it will continue to, uh, to decline as, uh, as we go forward based on the schedule that's been developed. The next chart that I want to look at is on page 22 of the, uh, the document. Page 22 looks at the uh, municipal budget trends. And what we're looking at here is what's the difference in different components of the budget or our tax program uh, over the past five year period. And what the chart does is it, uh, it takes each of the components of the general fund revenue statement and looks at where the <coughs> increases have been. As you can see, state aid uh, on the first <coughs> set of boxes is down 10.85% uh, from where it was. Uh, we've gone from 4.6 million coming down to 2.1 million in the 10-11 year. But you see that property taxes on average uh, is up by 3.52%. Uh, Overall, the average increase in, the, uh, in total revenues is about 2.4%. Uh, other highlights I think that are important is that when you look at the, uh, the tax roll, tax roll is difficult to compare because you're dealing with different assessment periods based on the revaluations. But the, uh, the market value per capita is an important consideration, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. What we're looking at is that for, uh, for every person in South Kingstown, there's about $140,000, $145,000 worth of taxable property uh, that supports that, uh, that person. The, uh, the next page, uh, page 23, uh, provides additional information uh, relative to the property tax distribution. And you can see that uh, that municipal share has gone up about 6% on average, where the school share is 2.8. Uh, the real reason that you've got the change there is because this looks at tax levy that goes both toward debt service and toward the transfer to the schools with a declining uh, debt service requirement for the schools, uh, we have not seen a decline in what the transfer to the school has been. Because if you jump down to uh, the municipal expenditure statement, <coughs> which is the bottom set of that chart, you'll see that the uh, school transfer is up on average of 3% uh, over the past uh, five year period, even though in the last two years, it's been flat uh, at the $47,909,000. Uh, overall, when we look at the, uh, uh, the general fund program, it's effectively about a 2.4% increase over where it was in the 5-6 year on a compound basis. Moving on, the next chart, uh, which is on, the detail is on pages 24 and 25, but I wanted to uh, provide, rather than just general numbers, uh, a, a charting of this. This looks at what the existing debt amortization is for the community. This assumes that if you were not to sell any additional bonds or do any uh, capital projects that required bonding over the next six years, where would the debt level be for the community? Uh, as shown here, debt level as of June 30th of 2010 was $30 million. If we didn't sell any of the 11 uh, million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars that's proposed within this budget document over the next six years there would only be ten million dollars in outstanding debt by the time you get to the 16 17 year that's a reduction a debt amortization of about 66 percent over a seven year period a debt amortization uh, a strong uh, debt retirement amortization uh, looks at a 10 year 60 percent so in seven years we're exceeding what, uh, what the benchmark would be for, uh, for debt. Obviously, 
a growing, uh, a growing community that is maintaining its service levels and, uh, uh, and dealing with uh, infrastructure improvement has got to see additional dollars expended getting down to the $10 million level while uh, a nice idea could in fact put the community in peril if they weren't taking care of their, uh, their facilities over the, over the next six years on programs that need to be, uh, need improvements. Uh, so while this chart shows for, uh, for bond purposes when we're dealing with bond council or, or dealing with the bonding agencies, uh, a rapid amortization period, what we really need to look at, which is uh, presented on the next chart and is on page 26, is what's the projected gross bonded debt level as we go forward when we add in the uh, $11,250,000 over the next seven years. Again, you're still seeing a reduction from the 2011 year, which will be at the $26.3 million level, down to 18. So you're adding 11,250,000 to the 26 million and you're still ending up where you'll be at $18 million. That means that you've still got a, a debt amortization over that uh, term of about 31%, which is exceedingly good and something that, uh, that uh, rating agencies would, uh, would, would be well satisfied with. Uh, we're showing here uh, the utility debt. We're not seeing any additional utility debt. We will be seeing new municipal debt, and we will be seeing another $2.5 million associated with, uh, with school purpose for, for bonding over that six-year term. And again, I caution, this capital improvement program is a forecast. It is more a community statement of need and how to address need than it is a budget document. What it, uh, that's why it's updated on an annual basis. Many <coughs> projects uh, that are listed today may fall off the table or may be uh, put to a later year, and new projects may come forward that need to be incorporated into the schedule next year. But when we look at this as a snapshot in time, this is what we would expect to occur by 2018 based on if this program was implemented dollar for dollar in the years in which they're anticipated and with the borrowing at the interest rates that have been uh, projected, which is at a 5.5% uh, 5 .5 interest rate, which is also exceedingly high in today's market. But again, we can't forecast that, that we won't see bond uh, interest rates climb <laughs> to the 6 or 7% range over that five-year period. So we'll use a very conservative number uh, of the 5.5 rather than assuming that we would be seeing a 4% uh, uh, rate as we go forward. The next chart is looking at what are the capital bonding projects for the, uh, for the six year schedule. And this is presented on page uh, 28 of the uh, capital improvement program. This is uh, a uh, an important page. This shows what the adopted program was, and again, I've already spoken to the issue of new programs being added. Here, it, uh, it's demonstrated where you can see uh, where there's a zero in the adopted program, like the technology, uh, information technology was shown at zero, it's now shown at 95. In past years, we were still appropriating ten twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year for technology <coughs> improvements, but it was only going through the pay-as-you-go. If it wasn't spent, it went into the capital reserve. Now what I'm trying to do is to identify for the public how we use the capital reserves to ensure that, uh, that they understand why we're using it. The major reason that you use capital reserve funding is to be able to appropriate dollars in advance of the project uh, expenditures being necessary so that you will not end up with a capital budget that spikes on a yearly basis. That's a key component to, uh, to stable budget management, is to ensure that you've got the money on a year-to-year -year basis available. It also helps us to look at what the depreciation value is on equipment. And we should be putting money in advance to be able to replace during the year that it's being used. It's, it, it, its value decreases if we put the money aside in that year for what the value reduction was during the year of its use we would then have the money available to be able to pay for it without having to have uh, sub uh, substantial capital dollars that take uh, property tax levy away from service levels. 
So as you can see here, we're gonna go through each of those projects. Uh, tonight, we're gonna go through all of the projects listed as uh, general municipal programs. Tomorrow night, we'll do the leisure services. <coughs> and uh, 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 the following week, we'll deal with the, uh, with the school program. Uh, I think what's important here is to look at is that uh, we're looking at uh, $11,250,000 or about 53.7% of the proposed $20,900,000 program would be paid for through municipal bonds. Uh, of that amount, uh, $6.5 million has already received voter approval. The other $4.7 million would need to go to referendum in uh, November of 2012. The projected general obligation schedule is presented on page 29. And what we're looking at is uh, four programs that would be funded in the 13-14 year for uh, four and a half million dollars. That would be a million dollars toward school facilities, two million toward the road improvement program, a million for the neighborhood guild and 500 toward uh, open space land acquisition. Again, if the, if we'll use an illustration of the open space acquisition, if there was not a need to borrow that money in 13, 14, it wouldn't be borrowed. This, would, uh, this is based on us anticipating a certain amount of money being expended on a yearly basis and a certain amount of money coming in from real estate conveyance taxes. If three years from now, what we've projected and what we've actually spent or what we've actually taken in in revenue differ, we may be able to delay that type of a project. Uh, neighborhood Guild is a million dollars, but what we're looking at is that that million dollars would be serviced through uh, trust funds available uh, for the Neighborhood Guild itself, so it would be without property taxation. Uh, the road improvements for the uh, uh, for road and bridge improvements, uh, that's one that if we accomplish the work that we anticipate in 11, 12, and 12, 13, we would need the two million in the 13, 14 year. If that work gets delayed, if there's problems associated with wetlands or uh, permitting requirements, then it may be that the 13, 14 year becomes a 14, 15 acquisition. We will know that as we go forward and as we uh, do the annual updates on this program. The, uh, the next chart, which is also on page uh, uh, 29, looks at the bond referendum necessity. In November 2012, we would uh, have $5.1 million in referendum uh, requests before the voters uh, if the <coughs> program were instituted as presented. Uh, the rest of that chart just simply shows uh, <coughs> the different monies that would be spent based on the referendums that have already been approved. Moving on, we're now gonna jump uh, over the projects themselves, and I'm gonna stay with the financials. So if you go to page 59 in the budget document itself, that'll take you to the debt service schedules. Prior year bonded uh, uh, debt, again, we've talked about this. Uh, if we go back to 2002 through 2011, we're seeing over the nine year period that's listed there about a 36% reduction. So we've uh, made a good effort, even though we're at, we were adding uh, debt during that term, we, saw, uh, we still saw a major reduction from 41 million down to uh, 26 million by the end of the close of this year. And that's presented on page 59. Uh, on page 60, uh, we've got a breakout of the capital projects by, uh, by the uh, uh, program type. As you can see, almost 9% is in the open space program, 37% uh, in recreation, 31% uh, in municipal projects. And we'd be using uh, that $11.25 million that I've already talked about. Uh, the projected gross bonded debt level uh, is presented on page 60. Uh, and again, we've talked about this already. We'll be down to about $18.44 uh, million, even with the $11,250,000 uh, added over the course of the six-year term. I want to now talk about uh, debt service. We've 
We've spent time talking about what the debt level is and what the relationship is to, its, uh, to, uh, to the population and per capita. Now I want to talk about debt service. Debt service is the repayment. It's your mortgage payment as the town that pays uh, and pays down the, both the principal amount that we owe and the interest that accrues on that principal amount. And what we're looking at uh, <clears throat> is that there are several ways of paying for bond debt service. Third party revenues are always what we're going to look to first before we look at property taxes. Right now, within the, uh, within the program that we operate, we receive third party uh, payments from state library construction aid, school building construction, fair share fees, uh, the guild's reinvested income as I spoke of earlier, uh, wastewater program pays back where we have uh, uh, wastewater management districts that have been uh, set up where sewer lines were extended and the uh, property owners had liens placed against their property and they're paying over a 20 year period uh, to service the, the debt that the town incurred. We're also using real estate conveyance taxes that uh, uh, are paid based on every uh, property transaction uh, that is uh, at arm's length that occurs in the community. And we're using reserves that are in the Superfund program. All of that detail as far as how much comes from each of those funding sources is presented within the, uh, the statistical pages that are presented on uh, pages uh, 71 through 74. So if you're interested in what the specific dollar amounts are, the third party revenues are spelled out there. When we show debt service, we show debt service in two manners. First, we show gross debt service. That's the full faith and credit of the community's debt service. That's how much we have to pay on a yearly basis. We show net debt service, which is uh, the gross debt less any of the third party revenues that I've got listed up on the board at this point. Net debt is what impacts the property tax because that's the funding source of last resort. Once we, uh, uh, we use all of those third party monies, the remainder comes out of the tax base. The next chart is on page 64 of the, uh, the document. On page 64, we're, uh, uh, we're looking at uh, the bonds that will be sold, the 11.25 million. 9.2 million will have to come out of tax base. Third party revenues that are available will be about $2 million. Again, the rec bond, which is associated with the guild, that million dollars will come out of reinvested income that's held for the guild, and the million 40,000 is the 40% uh, uh, reimbursement that would be anticipated with bonds that were sold subsequent to 2014 based on the legislative changes that occurred uh, in, the, uh, in the past session of the General Assembly. Actually, it should be 2013, I think, is it, Al? Mm -hmm. uh, 2013, so we're not anticipating selling any bonds until the 30% reimbursement level has increased to its maximum of 40%. So at that point, we would look at the 40% on the, uh, the $2.6 million, of which the state would then be responsible for one, uh, $1,040,000. They would also be responsible for their share of the interest uh, that would be on that $2.6 million in bonds. When we look forward, we're looking right now that the uh, average assessment home is at 346,000. The tax rate associated with debt is 66 cents, so uh, every house is paying about $230 toward the cost of debt service in the community, net debt service. When you go out to 2016-17, based on the reduction in the debt level, thereby a reduction in the debt service requirements, that'll drop down to about 45 cents uh, or about $66 less. Again, these are not actual numbers that, uh, that, are, uh, that are in stone. They are projections based on the financial information that we have at this time and based on all of the different assumptions that are made in the development of the document. Moving on to page 65, 
page 65 uh, forward looks at uh, measures that uh, uh, <clears throat> look at what the community's uh, benchmarks would be that would be considered with uh, rating agencies and provide us with some guidance as to uh, what the community's ability to, uh, to pay debt, uh, debt service, uh, what, what the level of uh, debt service repayment is that's safe within the overall tax structure. Uh, when we look at uh, debt service, what this chart looks at is assuming that there is a 1% growth in the, in the property tax levy, and if we could have a 1% growth in the property tax levy for the next six years, I think people would be very happy with that. I think that it'll probably be much higher, but I wanted to use a conservative estimation. I wanted to then look at what the debt service would be as a percentage of that uh, of the overall levy. <coughs> you can see in the 10-11 year, 7.3 cents of each of the dollars that we collect for levy is going toward, uh, uh, toward uh, uh, debt, and we're looking to see that uh, decline to about 4.6. That's the gross. The net dollars, that which comes from property tax would be about uh, 4.3 cents in the 10-11 year and would decline to about 2.8. Again, these are statistical presentations based on assumptions uh, and they will change on a yearly basis. However, our track record has been that while the numbers may change, they'll change insignificantly, uh, but the trend will, will be as presented. When we look at bonded debt as a percentage of the tax base, uh, you can see that we're looking at also a decline there. That is presented on page 66. Uh, when I look at uh, uh, what uh, Standard & Poor's is, uh, is looking at, uh, as far as this is concerned, uh, they're looking at uh, below 3% as being good. So we're well below that, uh, that amount. The assessed value per capita, I brought this point up earlier because I showed you what the overall value of the tax roll was. This shows you what the overall value is and what it has been over the last several years. This is important because this shows what the impact of the last revaluation was. This also shows why I have grave concerns on the education aid formula uh, because they will still be using the $175,000 value rather than the $144,000 that we're actually collecting at based on the reference years that are anticipated. Even if it's not the $175,000, it'll be at $173,000 and it means the potential for less dollars to the community based on them using uh, data which is, uh, uh, which is two years old. Debt per capita, again, from 833 down to about 514 on the gross, and down below $500 uh, in 1718 uh, when we look at what net, uh, net debt service is. And that's on page uh, uh, 67. Standard & Poor's looks at less than $2,000 uh, $2, uh, as being moderate. Uh, and under $500 is being extremely low. So we're certainly closer to low than we are to moderate in terms of uh, the debt per capita. The debt service is a percentage of uh, uh, per capita income, and that's presented on page 68. Uh, Standard & Poor's is looking at uh, 2 to 4 percent as moderate and uh, less than 2 percent as extremely low. So again, over the term, uh, we'll be uh, very close to the low margin uh, ranking that, uh, that Standard & Poor's is looking at, which obviously makes us look uh, very strong financially in terms of our ability to be able to pay any debt that we incur. Debt service is the percentage of operating revenues is presented on page 68. Uh, Standard & Poor's is looking at uh, between 2 and 6 percent as being moderate and 6 to 10 being high. Uh, again, what we're seeing is uh, as the budgets <clears throat> going forward have uh, slowed in terms of growth, and we've actually seen two years of decline in terms of the size of the general fund budget, uh, we're going to see that uh, uh, percentage of debt service to operating revenues will probably uh, stay relatively uh, close to 
what we've got on this chart here. It could actually, on the gross basis, be in the 4.5% range by the time we get to 17 if we continue to see stagnant budget uh, and we, uh, we do not see an expansion in the services that we provide. Uh, this next chart shows what the gross bonded uh, debt service would be. And the, uh, the line across shows what the net debt services or the property taxes that are associated with it. So you can see that property tax as a, as a overall share of the debt service requirements on a year annual basis will continue to decline. And that was an effort that we made uh, so that we can provide greater flexibility in terms of use of tax dollars for services rather than debt. Page 70, uh, uh, 74 in the document shows the projected uh, uh, debt level. Again, what I've tried to do is to take the information which is shown linear in the document and provide it in a, uh, in probably a, uh, which I hope is a uh, more readable manner in terms of uh, how the money flows because what we're looking at here isn't the numbers itself but the way the numbers actually flow from one side of the page to the other. What you don't want to see is debt level, which is going in the opposite direction. There will be years that you will see that when major capital <coughs> projects that require property, uh, property tax supports uh, are warranted, but at this point, based on the economy, we've tried to minimize what those would be. One of my favorite subjects on designated fund balance, presented uh, <clears throat> on page 70 of the document. And what we're showing here is that uh, as of uh, uh, June 30 of 2010, we had on designated fund balance of $9.3 million or 12.7%. Uh, I wanna make one thing clear when we talk about uh, undesignated fund balance and the need for it. This chart shows what undesignated fund balance has been since the 2002 year. And you can see uh, that the amount has gone from a low of around $5 million in 2002 up to a high point in 67 of around, uh, uh, around uh, 10 and a half million. And it's continued to decline from that point. Uh, the, uh, Undesignated fund balance as a percentage of the general fund has also uh, declined. <coughs> as I put into the budget uh, document, and I think it's an important uh, statement, is that in October of 2009, the Government Finance Officer Association, uh, GFOA, which uh, really provides guidance for municipal finance accounting, uh, <coughs> issued a, uh, uh, a best practices paper entitled Appropriate Level of Unrestricted Fund Balance in the General Fund. And what in fact they, uh, they presented as being best practices for general fund undesignated fund balance was two months of uh, budget to be set aside. Two months of a 12 month period is obviously 16.67%. If we looked at that, we would need an undesignated fund balance of uh, $12,170,000 thousand dollars on a 73 million dollar budget where we're sitting at uh, 9.2 based on where we're going in the 10 11 year if we ended up with a operating surplus of 250 thousand we'd be down to about 8.3 one of the other things that I think is important is that there will be projects of a non reoccurring nature that we do not want to bond those can be set asides from undesignated fund balance as a means of paying for those projects. Uh, classic illustration is several years ago, uh, we took a million dollars out of undesignated fund balance to pay down costs associated with Superfund. As we go forward, there are other projects that uh, may come that should come out of that fund balance. If we're not maintaining the balance, then we're either looking at bonding or delaying projects that are necessary for the community. This is a, uh, a necessary uh, financial reserve to be set up uh, for a uh, well-managed and healthy financial, uh, uh, financial operation. 
I want to now jump back to page 40 of the capital improvement program budget and we're going to look at the long-term municipal projects. <coughs> If you start at the bottom of page 40, it shows the general municipal program, public works improvements. Uh, Shockey, if you want to come up and help out on here, I could save my voice a bit. Uh, what we're looking at here is we have traditionally provided for a transportation improvement program. The transportation improvement program looks at all of the infrastructure that the community has and needs to maintain or expand upon and what the capital dollars are necessary to keep that, uh, uh, those facilities intact. These include, include road reconstruction, drainage infrastructure, bridges and dam uh, reconstruction and, uh, and study, as well as sidewalk construction and maintenance of the public works facility. Uh, while our public works facility is in, uh, in good shape, uh, I do want to, uh, uh, make sure people are aware that facility was originally constructed in 1975. It's now 35 years in age. We maintain it uh, uh, through the operating program, but there will be improvements, whether it's on the gas metering system or uh, dealing with the salt shed that are going to be necessary as we go forward. The transportation improvement program is presented on page 40 of the document. Uh, I'm sorry, page 41 of the document which shows the difference in the transportation improvement program proposed uh, for 2012 versus what it was in the 2011 uh, year. We're looking at about a $2 million increase in cost uh, for that program. Where's that money going to be spent? Uh, principally, it's going to be spent on reconstruction of arterial and collector roads. We have, uh, uh, we're looking at increasing the amount of general obligation bonds that will be necessary for this program from 1.5 million to 3.5 million. We're also looking at assuming that the environmental response program which is dealing with uh, TMDLs uh, is going to cost us in the area of $630,000 over the next six year period. Again, that's a placeholder. That's going to change on a yearly basis based on our interactions with DEM and our ability to uh, uh, provide uh, corrective actions that are in, in accord with what the state uh, DEM wants to see us do in terms of dealing with water quality on the uh, five water bodies that have uh, 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 environmental impacted uh, uh, water uh, qualities. When we deal with the road reconstruction, uh, we're dealing with uh, really a couple of things that I think are important. The first is that uh, we're using a considerable amount of money that came through ERA funds. These were the <coughs> dollars in the current year, and those will carry over into probably the 11-12 year. That'll be uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, a section of Matunic Schoolhouse Road. We're looking at reconstructing that road between uh, Green Hill Beach Road and, uh, and Moonstone. That's phase one. The second phase, which would be in the 11-12 year, would, uh, would be between Moonstone and uh, Matunic uh, Beach Road. Uh, Liberty Lane, we've done a, uh, a half of that. We'll be doing the other half of that uh, uh, as a part of this budget. And you can see what the conditions are that we're dealing with here. Uh, these roads need to be improved. Liberty Lane serves as a major uh, thoroughfare from Route 2 to the industrial district that uh, uh, has a great deal of our uh, industrial jobs in the community. That road needs to be, uh, be upgraded uh, at this point based on the heavy traffic that it receives. Uh, again, Matunic Beach Road uh, to Green Hill, uh, uh, Green Hill Beach Road. It'll be a full uh, uh, reclamation of that road with a two and a half inch binder and a finished course. Uh, the projected cost is around $1.6 million. Uh, Liberty Lane, uh, again, Fairgrounds Road to Route 2 is Phase 2 uh, that we expect to do, and we expect to get that project done uh, in the summer of 2011. John, jump on any of these that you need to present information on. 
The, the, the next chart shows all of the different roads. Uh, what I did here was to take the chart that's presented on page 42 and 43 and just break out the road detail. So that when we talk about how much money needs to be spent on roads, this talks about the types of roads that will be addressed both in the current year and through the next six years. It's really a seven year snapshot as to things that are going to need to see improvements, whether it's uh, the arterial roads or collector roads. Arterial roads are the main highways that are town roads. Those are the uh, Tucker Town roads, the uh, uh, Matunic Beach Road, uh, Green Hill Beach Road, all of those. And then we have the collector roads that deal with roads like Stony Fort or Fairgrounds or, uh, or Liberty Lane. These are all roads that are in, uh, in disrepair. We saw last year uh, what happens when we have uh, frost heaves. Moonstone Beach Road was destroyed. Uh, there is no road base on many of the town roads. Many of those roads started out as uh, gravel roads that then received a, uh, a, uh, uh, a matting of dust control. That provided a, a mat surface that was then stone sealed. Sand sealed first and then stone sealed. But there's no road base. If we're going to deal with those roads, we can no longer deal with them by putting stone seal on them. What we need to do is to be able to reconstruct those roads, which will uh, assist the community in terms of having a better road system uh, and will hopefully help as far as uh, uh, tourism is concerned and bring economic development uh, opportunities in terms of people wanting to be in South Kingstown and being able to tour many of the country roads that we have. Uh, the bridge program, I think the bridges and dams, this council recognizes the importance of it. We have rebuilt several dams at this point. Uh, we are probably leaders in the state as far as reconstruction. Did this come on the tail end of us losing a dam? Yes, it did. But what we've been able to do now is to have a program which periodically reviews all the bridges and dams in towns, provides us with an engineering summary, and provides us with uh, the basis for uh, developing the six-year program as it relates to uh, bridges and dams. The, uh, the next slide, which is on page uh, uh, 43 uh, of the document, uh, provides a summary statement what, uh, what we're looking at over the next uh, uh, six years. We anticipate total expenses of around $8.2 million. And based on funds that are on hand today within the reserve fund, plus the borrowing of the $3.5 million and about $620,000 a year coming from pay-as-you-go that goes into that reserve fund, we're looking to be able to deal with each of the roads that are presented within that document. John? Okay, let's uh, move on. Uh, public land uh, reserve is presented on page 44. Public land reserve, uh, we are proposing no funding over the next six years. As council is certainly aware, uh, our last acquisition provided us with uh, a stockpiling of land uh, at uh, uh, Dominic Savio that can be used for, don't go too far because we'll be getting to you soon. Uh, that will be uh, that will be used for expansion of municipal services as we go forward. The uh, the next project is the uh, 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 South Kingstown Public Library is dealing with the uh, Kingston Free Library, and uh, Cheryl, if you want to come up, uh, this project has been identified last year. It's a $300,000 pro, uh, program that uh, will deal really with uh, uh, two components. Uh, and those components would be the uh, painting of the uh, Manson roof and the uh, belfry, as well as the uh, uh, reshingling of the belfry. So those two projects are about $300,000. $50,000 pay as you go has come in over the last two years. Uh, we've got $152,000 in the reserve fund for library improvements, and uh, Shirley was successful again in obtaining a $100,000 grant. That grant was announced subsequent to the uh, uh, budget document being, uh, being presented, uh, so we now have the, uh, the full funding, 
It shows in the budget document on page 45 as a request. It's now been approved, so the project is online to be able to uh, move forward. Uh, again, it, uh, we're looking at about $302,000 will be available with a, a forecasted cost of uh, $300,000. First phase in 11-12 year would be $80,000 to uh, uh, have the roof replacement on the Belfry, and then second year would be the Mansard roof and uh, the Belfry for about $220,000 in the exterior painting. Last time that project was done, I think, was in 2002, was it? Yeah. Uh, and Shirley has been out on a ladder taking pictures, so I've made sure that I did put those in. On some of the, uh, the uh, on the public documents that we gave out, we were a bit stingy and did not put all of the different slides in just for the sake of trying to save paper. Anybody who wants Shirley's slides, they are available already on the website, uh, the town's website. The entire 113 slides that I'm providing tonight <coughs> are on the website in addition to the 76 that you got before you in the audience. Uh, so this is showing the, uh, the shingles the, the, that are worn, that, uh, the cupping, and some that have actually fallen out, as well as the, uh, the plashing uh, problems that are associated with the building. Uh, remember, this is the original, uh, one of the original five state court houses, uh, uh, and uh, it takes a great deal of money to maintain a building of that age. Uh, additional pictures on the cupping and the uh, uh, where we've got the nail popping through it on the uh, the roof itself. Uh, so again, phase two will be uh, scraping, caulking, painting of the exterior, and replacement of the uh, the rotted clapboard uh, as necessary. Cheryl. Oh, we got more pictures, Shirley. Too. <laughs> Okay. The shingles with some kind of poly, something to extend life. I mean, looking at them here, they all look, they've dried, spread, so on and so forth, but. Yeah. I just didn't know if we treated them to extend the life. And what is the average age of a red cedar shingle? Jim, anything that we do has to go through historical preservation, and we'll also be dealing with the painting companies. If there's no other questions, we'll move on. Page 46, gotcha. property revaluation. Again, use of the reserve fund, there's $752,000 that will be available as of June 30th of 2011. Forecasted price is the $752,000, and that will be done uh, for the mass appraisal that uh, needs to be conducted based on the state requirements. And that'll be for the, uh, the tax roll for the December 31st of 2012. Uh, the last one was done as a statistical revaluation, which was conducted for 1231 of 2009. Uh, I know Gene's looking forward to this uh, project going forward. Uh, but there are no additional dollars that will be necessary since the town council agreed both last year and the year prior to take uh, additional dollars into reserve uh, for this project to minimize what property tax requirements would be uh, up through the 2012-2013 uh, year. Moving on, town hall facilities. This is also a moving target. We deal with the town hall based on needs. <clears throat> we come up with, uh, uh, with different improvements that uh, are necessary. We uh, fund about uh, ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year into the reserve fund. Expenses that are anticipated uh, 
we expect over the next six years we'll probably spend upwards to three hundred thousand dollars some of that is the sprinkler system in the basement now that certainly is a uh, of interest to us based on the problems that we had two years ago three years ago now uh, also the generator is a wish list item at this point uh, not one that I'm prepared to go forward with but certainly uh, it would be good to have the generator here rather than having to move operations to one of the buildings that does have a generator uh, we're also looking at unscheduled work uh, I think the council's aware we purchased the property from uh, st. Francis Church uh, we have the ability to build an additional parking facility uh, at this point there's not a need for that expansion we will have to look at the existing parking lot that needs to uh, uh, be resealed uh, in probably within the uh, the next few years but again pay as you go puts money into this budget we also uh, fund through the operating budget around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year that goes into maintaining this building next is the uh, municipal uh, planning uh, reserve and this is a uh, uh, a program where at this point the capital reserve has about a hundred nine thousand Vin are you out there uh, and one of the things that uh, Mr. Murray and I have been looking at is the uh, uh, proposal to uh, provide for uh, community surveying. Uh, I have provided to the council a, uh, a document to, of which I don't have a copy of, uh, which deals with uh, a program known as the, uh, the National Citizen Survey. And uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it tonight. I've given the detail to the council, but uh, we think that this uh, type of a survey would be an important thing for the community to, uh, uh, to become involved in. It would look at both uh, program planning, it'll look at budgeting, it'll look at goal setting, and it'll look at, uh, at, uh, at level of services. As we go forward, the, there is going to be a need for us to look at what services that we're doing that we don't need to do or that we can't afford to do. We think that this uh, will be the first step in terms of looking at what does the community perceive as the service levels that they're getting, as well as uh, are there things that we're not doing that they need more of. Uh, so the document, I, we're providing you with a copy of I asked Vin if he'd be prepared to talk about how he sees this uh, dovetailing with the comprehensive community plan as well as as we move forward in terms of being able to use benchmarks as far as performance standards uh, in the community. Vin? Thank you. 
Yeah, we've also, you know, we've given you a copy of what uh, some of the sample questions would be that would be used. Uh, I've also talked with North Kingstown, and they've expressed an interest in reviewing this as well, because uh, it would be interesting to see whether the levels of service as well as the satisfaction with service levels, uh, how they compare with comparable communities in Rhode Island. Uh, this would give us, on a national basis, a review. It would be nice if we could see other Rhode Island communities and the, what the perception is of what the services are or what the services need to be uh, as we go forward. So I'd like uh, to give the council an opportunity to review those uh, the, the types of survey. The other thing that they'll allow us to do is to put four local questions onto the survey itself. So if there's information that we want on a specific topic, uh, we can add that to the survey. We also can have a management report and an executive summary, and if we want, we can also have them come in and do a public presentation on uh, what they've found. Uh, certainly, we're not going to say that uh, they're going to find everything that is wonderful, because if we thought that, there would be no need for the survey. But I think what it should do is to give us some guidance as to are there things that we're not seeing and that the general public is quiet on and really hasn't brought to the, uh, to the town's attention that is something that could be serviced. Now, it may have been that if we'd had this type of surveying done, elderly services would have been addressed earlier than it was in the community, or EMS services. So there's those different types of things to say, how are we doing, are we doing enough, are we doing too much, and if we're doing too much, what are we doing too much of? And I think that the survey will give us some general ideas. It's not going to give us specific information, but it'll give us general ideas as to what the perception is in the community. The other thing that I had some serious questions on is some of the surveying that we've done in the past for the comprehensive community plan. The questions, uh, I don't know, uh, I'll be kind. I, I think some of the questions, uh, we're looking for specific answers. And I think that what I want to do is to have it so that we're not putting the questions together, but rather that they're, uh, they're valid questions from a survey uh, point of view that uh, are not leading to a certain answer uh, because that's the answer you want to see. And uh, the other thing that we're looking at is that this would be conducted uh, at two different times. We look to do it in the 11-12 year, and then we would look to do a second survey to see how well we're doing in terms of adjusting to the things that come through the first survey, uh, I believe three years later. And that would also uh, assist us in terms of keeping the uh, comprehensive community uh, plan fresh. You know, questions that deal with, is there enough economic development? Is there enough uh, commercial available? Are those different things, are, are the needs of the public being met? We may assume that they are, but it may be an, an assumption that's not, that, that we're not having people walk through the doors, but they will fill out a survey and tell us what they think. So we think this is a valid tool for uh, uh, hopefully enhancing uh, what the services that we are providing and to get a unvarnished look at what the community at large, using a, a 1,200 uh, household survey that's random sampled, that will then also look at the demographics of the people that do answer the survey. So it's, it's, it's there. It's not going to take new tax dollars. It will work from, again, reserve funding that's available for planning purposes. But uh, I'd ask the council to take a look at that before we get to the final budget adoption of the capital improvement program and whether this is a uh, worthy uh, new initiative to be considered. Any questions on that? Next is uh, the energy program. I, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we wanted to identify all of infrastructure improvement activities that are ongoing, rather than just those that we're paying for. So what I asked uh, Vin to do is, since he is uh, uh, responsible for the energy conservation program at this point, uh, uh, he was the last one into the staff meeting that day, uh, the, I asked him to provide uh, a narrative and you can tell it's Vin's because it goes on for three pages. And I'll ask him now to summarize the use of the federal dollars, the state dollars, and the grant dollars that, uh, that we have available to us 
and how we're moving forward with that in conjunction with the school department. Vin?
I mean, the key importance to us is that we need to make a commitment toward energy conservation. And this money provides really the, the foundation for us being able to make uh, building improvements. With the ESCO contract, it should give us a baseline on all of our buildings as to where the best return on investment would be for improvements. Once we get that in place, we've got around $300,000 that can be used uh, and leveraged toward doing those improvements in conjunction with the ESCO contract. Because the ESCO contract uh, doesn't get paid, but uh, gets paid based on the energy savings. So we can, we can probably leverage that $300,000 to, uh, uh, to a much sizable dollar amount in terms of improvements. But the key is to get the buildings analyzed, come up with what the recommendations are, and then be able to start addressing each of those concerns. So I think the 400,000 that's listed here, once the ESCO company is done, we may have several year new programs that will show uh, energy conservation improvements on different municipal or school buildings as we go forward. So I don't think that this is an end all. I think this is just the first step. And as we see uh, prices on oil and gas continuing to escalate, we're going to need to do more to be able to be more efficient in our operations. Okay, if we can move on, because uh, Alan is telling me I'm falling behind on my schedule, <laughs> which is usual. Uh, the next is information technology program. We are at a point where we need to make new commitments to the information technology program in the town. Uh, computers came into the town after Alan and I, and in the mid-80s, uh, we got our first computer in South Kingstown, and we were word processors, and then they were uh, standalone units that uh, did Excel or, uh, or multi-plan. And since then, we've cobbled together a network of, and system. Two weeks ago at the council meeting, you approved rewiring of five of the major buildings in town to be able to do uh, the necessary wiring inside the buildings themselves. We now have to look at the hardware because some of the hardware that's in place now is uh, well beyond its useful life and is in need of being updated. Uh, so what we're looking at is coming up with really the first of a five-year program, and I think this program will expand as we go forward in terms of uh, uh, dealing with several different aspects. One will be uh, upgrade of the servers that we have uh, in town hall that also service each of the outbuildings, whether it's public services, the senior program, or uh, the guild, or interaction with the police department. But server visual, uh, virtualization is really nothing more than being able to buy one piece of hardware that can operate three different or four different operating systems and be able to, uh, where in the past you would have to have a server for each of those different components. What we'll do is become much more efficient because we won't need to buy as many licenses uh, for the software and we'll have uh, better maintenance, uh, maintenance controls. Once, the, uh, once we upgrade all of the servers, we then need to be able to centralize our record keeping. At this point, each of the departments maintains their own record system uh, on their hard disks within their offices. <clears throat> If they're not properly backed up, there's a potential loss for data. Uh, directory service in an active directory means that everything will go centralized into the servers itself so that nothing will be maintained as town record other than through the main computer systems themselves. That way, they are uh, backed up, uh, I believe, every three hours, and they are stored off-site in the cloud as far as all of our records. Uh, we need to get to the active directory. At this point, we've moved to a point where we're using the beginning of an active directory. In fact, tonight, 
what you're seeing on screen is coming not from the computer itself, but from the network at, uh, the network at, at Town Hall. Uh, and this network has availability so that uh, each of the different computers that have access to this uh, part of the server have all of the, uh, all of the budget records. Instead of me having records on my file that I then have to swap with Alan or I swap with any of the municipal <coughs> departments, we need to get to the active directory. We then need to uh, uh, bring email in-house. Right now that's being done through a third party. Uh, that means that uh, we can't use many of the services that you want with email in terms of being able to look at John's uh, schedule so I know when he's available without having to talk with John to be able to, uh, to deal with uh, uh, backup of the email records themselves so that we've got those for, uh, uh, for legal purposes. The second part of the visual, uh, virtualization on the servers is to really get to a point where we'll have redundancy built in so that if a server goes down, we'll have availability of all the records through <coughs> the second server itself. Uh, we're looking at the archiving of the, uh, the email, as I noticed, and then what we're looking to do is to get into a voice over IP, which is really uh, integrating the telephone systems and the computer systems uh, into one, one basic program. That would uh, <coughs> save us uh, considerable dollars in terms of the number of lines that we have to uh, lease from the, uh, the various uh, providers. It'll also provide us with an ability to mix uh, voicemail and emailing uh, in, the same, uh, in the same categories. All of these things are services that will make us more efficient in our operation, and hopefully, if we're more efficient, we can provide better services with less dollars. Uh, this is the start. As we go forward, we are also going to have to look at, is the software that we're using the most appropriate software at this point, or are there upgrades that are, uh, are necessary? Financial uh, management systems in and by themselves could in fact cost three to four hundred thousand dollars with thirty or forty thousand dollars a year uh, in maintenance costs associated with them. We need to build <coughs> the networking base itself, the server base itself, and then be able to look at the software that's going to run on that hardware. It doesn't make a lot of sense for us to look at changing software until we have the infrastructure in place to be able to drive that software and to get it out to each of the users. Uh, what used to be a luxury of having a computer on the desk now is old school. It needs to be upgraded so that we have access through networks for each of the different uh, uh, computers, centralized record keeping and uh, archiving of that documentation. So this is uh, a program which on, over the past years we've provided about $10,000 a year and it was replacing various components. We're now taking a much more systemic review of the system, and this program will probably be expanding in the next few years. But at this point, we're looking at uh, really maintaining status quo until we can get some of the hardware and the wiring completed. Uh, if we were going to do our own wiring between buildings, we're talking about another major expense of probably close to $200,000. I don't see that as necessary at this point but it will be something that we would want hard wiring available with each of the buildings and not having to use lease lines from the telephone company or the cable companies uh, sometime in the future. That's where the technology uh, system needs to go and we're starting that over the next five years, you'll see this program expand. Uh, that brings us to the public safety program. In the past, Public safety was done on a year-to-year -year basis. On page 52 uh, is the, uh, the chief's description of the three components of the public safety uh, uh, program that's capital uh, service directed. That is uh, maintenance and upgrade on its computer systems. Second is the communication system that, uh, that public safety uh, manages on behalf of fire services, EMS, and, uh, and police, and then just the, uh, the building and infrastructure uh, reserve. I've broken out the program. We operate with one capital reserve fund for public safety, but there's three components. As I mentioned, the first is the uh, computer systems. What we'll be looking at over the next several years is the replacement of uh, uh, peripherals with, uh, within the, uh, the public uh, safety building 
chief documents the number of units that they have. Many of those units need to be replaced. As with all of our systems, nothing gets replaced unless it needs to be replaced. Somebody can say something has a four-year useful life. If it works six years, it's going to work six years. We can replace the component, but we need the dollars available to be able to do that on a time, uh, timely basis. Same thing with the communication system. We've just completed uh, the major overhaul of our communication system. Uh, and what we're looking at now is the uh, uh, in 11-12 replacement on the telephone system uh, that's been in place since the new facility was constructed back in uh, uh, 2000. Uh, and that we'll, what uh, there is is a schedule uh, between 2013 and 16 of specific components of the equipment that will need to be replaced. All of that is documented uh, in detail. It's certainly in summary form in the budget document. This has always been resonant to the pay-as-you-go portion of the capital budget, but we've never shown what the documentation was in terms of what the value of the different reserve fund uh, requirements are. And again, if we didn't have the reserve fund where we're providing money on a yearly basis, we would have to have spikes in the capital budget uh, uh, when certain uh, expensive components needed to be replaced. Public safety communications, uh, we talked about. Third is the, uh, the building itself. Uh, that's a large facility that needs to be maintained. What we're looking at now is, uh, uh, re is the uh, incorporation of a new HVAC system in the basement, which is where now all of their servers and uh, uh, computer equipment and communication equipment, uh, core, uh, core infrastructure is being kept. Uh, and we we'll also need to replace the uh, uh, chiller, which is for the uh, air conditioning on the, uh, on the main building itself. So we're looking uh, over that, uh, that uh, term over the, uh, through 2014, spending about uh, $112,000. Uh, Pay-as-you-go funding will provide about $80,000 over the term of the six-year period. Uh, this is a summary. Right now, we've got about $94,000 held in reserve. Uh, in the 10-11 year, there's another 45000 And then over the next six years, pay-as-you-go will put about $273,000 out. Uh, that's on pages 53 and 54 of the other uh, document. That uh, then brings us to go into the pay-as-you-go portion of the budget. And if you go to page 88, and we're in the home stretch. Page 88 starts the road improvement program. We've talked about the six-year program uh, and all of the different components. There's $610,000 that's proposed in the capital budget in the 11-12 in the year that'll go into this program. Uh, when we look at it, what we're averaging is between six ten dollars and $640,000 a year that goes in. That's the pay-as-you-go component. And again, you'll need the bonding dollars as well as the dollars that are already held in reserve. Uh, what are we looking at doing over the next uh, year? Uh, again, Matunic Beach Road, the sidewalks. We still want to complete the sidewalk project uh, from, uh, from the community market down to the uh, crosswalk that takes you into the town beach. Uh, that section hasn't been completed. It's been delayed. Uh, we need to get uh, an agreement in place with the property owner uh, where the laundromat is located uh, before we can complete that project. We've talked about TMDLs. There's about $100,000 in TMDL work that uh, we're looking to reserve this year. We're also looking to uh, eventually deal with Jerry Brown Farm Road once the issue of uh, road ownership and the right-of-way ownership is completed. And we're also going to be doing a bridge inspection program. Again, same slide, dealing with the Tunic Schoolhouse uh, 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 road improvements that are necessary, uh, as well as the sidewalk improvement that would be necessary on Matunic Beach Road, TMDLs, uh, and Jerry Brown. We're also looking at the bridge. This is a, uh, a shot of the, uh, the uh, underpinning girders for the uh, uh, Silver, Lake, uh, uh, Silver Lake Bridge. We are in a position where during the 11-12 year, we need to conduct uh, the next comprehensive inspection on, this, on the town's five bridges and the six uh, uh, large uh, diameter culvert uh, uh, 
uh, that serve as bridges uh, in the community. Once that uh, uh, inspection program is completed, it provides for the brick and mortar component for the next six years on dealing with the bridges, uh, uh, the bridges and the, uh, the culverts. We'll also uh, continue to be uh, reviewing the dams that we, uh, they own. The last dam that we're doing major improvements to is the uh, factory pond dam. That work is scheduled for this spring. It'll be done as part of the current year budget within the water fund. Public works equipment that needs to be uh, uh, replaced in the 2011-2012 uh, year. We're looking at uh, uh, four pieces of equipment that will be replaced. One is a, uh, a medium uh, dump truck for $135,000. Uh, the second is the uh, replacement of a roadside uh, flail uh, mowing tractor, a pickup truck, as well as purchasing uh, a piece of add-on equipment for the uh, uh, payloader, which are grapples that uh, can be used for storm uh, damage-related uh, uh, pickups. First is the dump truck. The, it's a 1998 dump truck that needs to be replaced, 75,000 miles. Uh, the truck is heavily rusted. Uh, I want to say that the uh, mechanics of the highway department do a, uh, an unbelievable job in maintaining the equipment. Uh, at this point, though, even with the painting that's done and the, re, uh, and the welding that's done as far as new components being added to these trucks, they need to be replaced on a timely basis. This is a six-wheel uh, dump truck that needs to be replaced. Part of the snow routes, uh, uh, it also comes with a, uh, a sander body so that uh, there's no add-on to this. It's, it's a tilt uh, body that uh, provides for sanding uh, during snow emergencies. Second is the uh, flail mower. Uh, based on personnel cutbacks where we were operating three machines, we only have personnel to operate two machines. At this point, we're going to replace two machines with, uh, we will potentially uh, replace two machines with one new machine. I say potentially because the bidding documents will be prepared in such a way that we'll look at what the, uh, the uh, purchase value will be uh, on the old equipment. If it's, uh, if it's too low, we'll keep, the, uh, keep one of the two units. We expect that uh, uh, cost to be around $85,000 net of the, uh, uh, the trade-ins that uh, could, uh, could come with the equipment. This is used not only for the uh, roadside mowing, but also for maintenance on the Superfund sites. Now that those have been uh, rehabbed, we have to maintain the, uh, uh, the grass surface, uh, and those have to be cut uh, on an annual basis. The, uh, the picture that's on the board now is, uh, uh, is the debris management grapples. Uh, this is an add-on that uh, will go either with a payloader or the skid steer, uh, so that if we end up uh, with uh, a hurricane condition and we have to deal with debris management, we've got uh, the proper equipment uh, to be able to pick up the material uh, for, uh, uh, for proper disposal. It's an expensive piece of equipment, uh, but it's one that uh, if we wait until we have the storm, it's too late to buy it. We're also looking at the uh, replacement of one pickup truck, one with 85,000 miles on it. We're expecting about a $36,000 price. It also uh, has a dedicated snow and, uh, and sand route. Uh, it's necessary for us to be able to, uh, uh, be able to uh, maintain the number of roads that we have in the community. Uh, that brings us to the public safety program. Uh, if you move to page 83 and page 80, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, on page 91, of the, uh, the capital budget. Uh, we're looking at uh, pay-as-you-go for $18,000. Uh, this is, again, as I explained earlier, for replacement of uh, some of the workstations as well as the, uh, the laptops that are in use in the police department. We need to provide an annual uh, uh, 
transfer to that reserve fund to have adequate dollars available for the uh, replacement, and the replacement will occur uh, on an as-need basis. Uh, public, uh, we're looking at the building where there'll be $15,000 in funding that will be put into the reserve fund, and this again will deal with the two items I've already mentioned, the standalone air conditioning unit for the new computer room, as well as dealing with the chiller uh, replacement uh, for one of the roof units for the uh, uh, air conditioning of the, uh, of the building. Third uh, uh, component is the uh, uh, computer system up, oh, I went the wrong way. Uh, the computer room, this, uh, these are pictures of the, uh, the new storage room, which now has the servers in it that uh, we need to be able to provide the air conditioning for. Uh, next item is the uh, Harbor Master uh, uh, boat needs the engine replaced at this point. Uh, we'll be reviewing this. It has over 2,000 hours on the motor at this point uh, and is beginning to uh, create difficulties in terms of keeping that boat on the water during the summer. Replacement of the engine is around $20,000. On the EMS program, uh, uh, I've given you a detail as far as uh, vehicle replacement. Uh, we operate with uh, five EMS vehicles. Three of those are online at all times. Uh, so you have two ambulances, transport ambulances online, and you have one uh, first responder uh, uh, four-wheel uh, rig. You also have one backup ambulance so that if one of those two ambulances that are online go down, that you've got a replacement for it and you have the same with the, uh, 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 with the Tahoe. So you operate with five vehicles, two in reserve and three in active, uh, active duty. What we're looking at is the replacement in the 11-12 year of vehicle number one transport ambulance in 13-14, uh, the uh, uh, the Tahoe replacement, and then uh, vehicle three, which is another transport out in the 15, 16 year, and then again, starting again, we'll be replacing in 16, 17, the vehicle that we're purchasing in 11, 12. Uh, there's about $445,000 in future funding that'll go through the pay as you go, so that we're not looking at having to appropriate $150,000 in one year when we're buying the equipment. Uh, we'll also be, uh, uh, be using the $106,000 that's in the capital reserve uh, for the program. Uh, this is the uh, picture of the, uh, the transport ambulance as well as the first responder vehicle. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with them. As far as the uh, public safety reserve for, uh, for EMS, again, we operate uh, from two different offices, one in the public services building on, uh, on Route 1 and the other within the police station itself. Uh, what we need to do is to set money aside on an annual basis to be able to make uh, physical improvements within the workspace that uh, EMS operates in. The conditions within the main building, uh, or uh, let me start out with the uh, South Station. South Station is in the Public Services building. Uh, what we hope to do is to be able to bring them down to the first floor, have them uh, really have retrofitted office space there. Uh, the, right now they're working 12 hour shifts. If in the future that needs to expand to 24 hours, we need to make sure that we have facilities available for sleep arrangements as well as the kitchen facilities. Uh, we're looking at uh, $35,000 uh, going into uh, the reserve fund for those improvements that'll be coordinated through uh, John Shock's department. Uh, right now there's about $31,000 that's available that is being spent, a portion of that's being spent in the current year uh, to be able to deal with the uh, kitchen facility retrofit uh, in public services. Uh, these are the current conditions that uh, exist in the South Station. It's a small room, it needs to be moved. Uh, we need to be able to provide shower facilities as well. Uh, so what you've got is an office as well as a sleeping and a, a refrigerator all in one room. It's not adequate for, for what, we're, what, what we're providing based on the work schedules that are necessary. In the North Station, the uh, uh, facility uh, is now, you know, it's operated 24 seven and the building now is, uh, is 10 years old. So what we're looking at is that there were uh, residential grade uh, appliances 
as well as uh, the cabinetry that was put in. We need to provide uh, a more durable uh, kitchen space within the, uh, uh, the public safety complex. Moving on, Kingston Library, we've already talked about. Uh, I don't think there's any need to go into it. We, we do need to have uh, one more year of capital reserve funding to be able to get the $300,000 necessary to finish that project. Last three items uh, are the GIS mapping. What that $5,000 is for is for the purchase of the server that's necessary for the GIF, uh, GIS program. Uh, the, the last server that, uh, uh, that we purchased <coughs> is several years old at this point and needs to be replaced. Uh, the technology uh, program, I've already talked about, the pay-as-you-go transfer would be $10,000 into that reserve fund. We've already talked about town hall renovations there. Uh, we talk about a $5,000 transfer into that uh, reserve fund so that we can do the work on an as necessary basis. The uh, chart here is the uh, final summary of the pay-as-you-go capital improvement program. It uh, is presented uh, in detail on pages 102 through 106. Uh, and this is the first page uh, and shows you the total proposal of $1,239,000, uh, which is shown on shown on uh, let's see page 103. If there's no questions, I want to move on to the water fund. Uh, and again, the water fund is started on page. 96. There were four projects that were listed. Uh, one was the uh, upgrade of the SCADA system. Two were uh, management reports that uh, uh, can be delayed. In fact, that X is in the wrong place. It should be on the 19,000, not the 30,000. The leak detection is necessary. Uh, So again, when we start moving the SCADA system, uh, make sure everybody understands what we're talking about. SCADA is the Supervisory Controlled and Data Acquisition System. What this does in the water system is it, uh, it maintains the pumps, uh, the floats within the, uh, uh, the standpipe so that is, when water is necessary based on the, the standpipes uh, 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 being exhausted, uh, the pumps automatically turn on and it's all based on uh, the computerized system that's here. Uh, we're looking at about a $27,000 cost. None of this comes through property tax. This is all part of the capital improvement program for the water fund. Water fund uh, is paid for based on third party revenues and uh, user fees. And we'll uh, deal with the operating budget for the water fund when we put the uh, general municipal budget out in March. Second item is the uh, infrastructure plan. Uh, we had anticipated that that would have to be done during the 2011-2012 year. We now uh, find that uh, we've got approval from the state that it won't be due until 2015, so that will be delayed. The supply management uh, uh, plan, water resources requirement, that also will not be due based on John's earlier submittals uh, till 2015. We submitted them several years ago and they've just been approved now, so they've said if we've just approved the documents now, the next documents won't be done uh, due till the fifth, uh, 2015 year. Again, that'll be incorporated as far as a revision in, this, in the water funds uh, program uh, when you see the capital budget uh, for adoption uh, at the end of the, uh, end of the month. Leak detection. Leak detection is uh, a program where what we need to do at this point is to purchase equipment uh, that will be able to uh, look at the water system itself and determine where there are, in fact, uh, leaks occurring. To give you an idea, we, the difference between what we purchase in water to what we sell in water, in other words, what we actually bill for, on the South Shore system, we lose about 13.9% of the water. Some of that's used for fire hydrants. Some of that's used for uh, cleaning of the, uh, of the water system, the hydrant, uh, uh, hydrant cleaning. So it's not all leakage that's occurring, but a, a certain portion of that is. 
proper leak detection, you should have no more than 10% of the water uh, that's unaccounted for. That means that we've got some leaks, whether they're at the curb stops themselves or whether it's uh, uh, joints within the pressurized pipe system that uh, need to be tightened up. Uh, those are things that need to be determined. On Middle Bridge, <coughs> we're looking at over 20% of the water that's purchased is lost within that system itself. A lot of that is uh, some of the older curb stops that are there. That water system was installed back in the, uh, uh, the mid-70s. Uh, 1975, 1976 year is when that uh, system uh, went in. And <coughs> there are leakage where some of the systems are shut off. There's still water that's, uh, that's getting out of those, uh, those pipes. The equipment that we would purchase uh, actually are, are, are correlators. It, and what they do is they sit on the valves uh, within the water system itself. So if you put them on uh, two valves that are closest to one another, you can determine whether there's any loss of water between those two points. If there is, then you can identify with the software how close the leak is from one end to the other. That way they can either dig up or they can deal with the uh, curb stop replacements. So we need to buy that equipment at this point uh, and the software necessary to be able to, uh, to do better uh, leak prevention. To give you an idea, with the losses that we have this year, collectively there's about a 14.6% loss. Probably 6-7% uh, uh, to 7 would be legitimate loss in terms of hydrant cleaning uh, or uh, hydrant use. Uh, the rest of it is, uh, is, is really... Uh, dollars that we're paying for water that we're not being able to bill out for. This year, water loss uh, that was paid for is about $18,000. So if we can uh, come up with an effective system that can cut that down in the nine to $10,000 range, the cost of the, uh, the $30,000 has a buyback of, uh, of really about three years. Then the equipment's in place and it can continue to be used. Uh, so I think that this is an important uh, first step in terms of being able to deal with some of the leakage that we have uh, within that system itself. I'm also anticipating that uh, United is in for a rate increase. If they were in for a rate increase, if we uh, continue to do nothing, the cost of water acquisition will go up and the value of water loss uh, in terms of uh, what customers are going to have to pay for that they're not getting uh, goes up as well. So this is an efficiency move uh, in terms of dealing with it. Uh, dealing with this head on. It'll not, you know, our, our efforts have already begun. We have borrowed uh, the correlators and the software from another company at this point. Uh, we've tried it. We see that it is effective in, uh, in isolating where the losses are. Uh, and we think that we should have that equipment in house uh, to be able to be used on a uh, ongoing basis. The wastewater program, wastewater program is looking at uh, expenditure of about $310,000. And I'm going to walk you through those items. Uh, but before I do, I want to make sure that uh, people are aware. We operate the wastewater treatment facility as a regional facility. The regional partners are South Kingstown, Narragansett, and the university. Payment on capital costs are based on how much of each capital component is being used by each of the partners. That's determined based on the flow of materials from each of those partners through each of the different uh, program components. So when we deal with the wastewater treatment plant, 37.2% is South Kingstown related, 44% is Narragansett. So 44% of the flow that goes through that plant is from Narragansett uh, uh, customers. Therefore, on a capital basis, they pay 44% of those costs. URI, 18%. On the Silver Lake pumping station, again, the, the distribution is almost 67% of the flow through there is South Kingstown. URI's flow is 33%. Conversely, at the pumping station in Kingston, 86, almost 87% would uh, be university related. So any improvements we make in Kingston, 87% of that cost is paid for by the university. At Silver Lake, 66% is paid for by South Kingstown. Now let's look at the improvements themselves. Uh, infrastructure, uh, telemetry, pumping stations, uh, and uh, 
and the, uh, the head works at the treatment plant. First, on the infrastructure of the building, uh, we need to deal with the uh, tar and gravel roof. Uh, that's about a $50,000 uh, uh, program. Again, that facility was constructed in 76 and 77. Uh, it's been well maintained and preserved, but the reason that it's well maintained is because we do spend the money on an annual basis to be able to uh, uh, ensure the envelope uh, uh, is in proper condition. Of that 50,000, 18,640 would be a South Kingston <coughs> cost. Telemetry, uh, another skater system that uh, needs replacement. Projected cost is around thirty thousand uh, dollars. South Kingstown would share about eleven uh, eleven thousand one hundred and eighty four dollars on that. Again, the, uh, the skater system at the uh, uh, sewer treatment plant not only operates the sewer treatment plant but also works with each of the pumping stations and also intrusion uh, uh, alarms for, uh, uh, for for each of the facilities. Uh, it's a major program. Uh, it needs to be upgraded at this point. Hopefully that 30,000 is a high number because I believe that what we'll be able to do is to upgrade the software rather than to re uh, <coughs> replace it. In the Local uh, pump station improvements. Uh, uh, we're looking at uh, replacing existing sludge grinders at the uh, uh, salt pond and hospital pumping stations. This is all 100% South Kingstown costs. Uh, so of the $30,000, all of that will be $30,000 will be uh, local share paid for by the, uh, the rate, you, uh, rate payers within the uh, wastewater system. Silver Lake Pumping Station, we need to uh, add a fourth uh, uh, pump at the facility. <coughs> That's estimated to cost about $170,000, $113,000 of which would come from, or $114,000 that would come from South Kingstown. We're also looking at uh, improvements that are necessary on the influent headworks uh, and the uh, primary treatment upgrade. Uh, picture here shows uh, uh, some of the corrosive uh, uh, conditions of the uh, uh, at the influent headworks itself. The concrete uh, is spalding at this point, so we need to uh, repair that and to provide a protective coating uh, over the uh, the concrete to preserve it. We're expecting that to be a $30,000 cost, of which we would pay about 11200 And that's the end of tonight's presentation. If you still want to keep going, we can stop for tomorrow night. <laughs> uh, any questions? Unbelievable. Any questions here at the table? Jim? Uh, Steve, why the uh, fourth pump at uh, Silver Lake? Increased volume at Silver Lake. Why, why the uh, extra pump, the new pump? John, can you use the mic too? As time marches on, you know, the flow does increase through that pump station for our properties in South Kingston that come onto the sewer system in addition to the university is increasing their volume, but primarily it's for more for backup purposes. Yep. When we had that storm in March, we had uh, wastewater that uh, came up through the well itself and was up to the uh, up to the uh, the upper landing. Uh, I mean, we need to be able to uh, have the the equipment redundancy there uh, if we end up with those type of uh, emergency situations. Makes sense. <laughs> and my last question: uh, What kind of a schedule are the EMS folks on? You mentioned 12-hour shifts. I don't know how many total employees, but Four days on, three days off. Uh, how does it work to keep everybody healthy and um, There's two different alert. work schedules. Uh, we have a 24-hour uh, shift that is worked for the people that are on the uh, vehicle that operates 24 hours a day. The other uh, people that operate the 12-hour, obviously they're operating for, uh, for 12 hours a day. It's based on a work schedule where they're working approximately, I think, 42 hours every, uh, every fourth week. Fourth week. So I mean, it, essentially, you've got them working uh, 24 hours, so they'll work two days okay. in a seven-day work period, okay. and it goes on and off that way. Good. All right. Thank you. Further questions at the table before we open it to the public? At this time, if we have any questions from the public, if you'd come to the mic. I think this is an indication of your exemplary work, Mr. Alfred. 
No, I think I put them all to sleep. <laughs> no, no. no, it's fascinating. Okay, um, I would just like to thank you and all of the staff and Alan that supported your presentation tonight. The um, PowerPoint was outstanding, user-friendly. Um, I know I had some difficulty with um, figuring out what a grapple was, so I appreciate some of the pictures that you have in here with um, some of the equipment um, that the town uses. So at this time, this is the beginning of a process, and we will be back here tomorrow night for part two of our capital improvement plan, and we're also meeting on the January 13th with the school committee. That is our third session for the capital improvement plan. So any final comments before we adjourn? Thank you again. Meeting is adjourned.